my mother and me and my um, and my son and uh, and my wife and everybody that was involved with taking care of my mother. And basically, it was directed towards my mother and my family. So, um, why did she stay in hospital? Why did she leave? Well, I was. October the 14th or 15th, 1989, and she came to my house, and the next day, she was very sick, and we took her to the hospital. Uh, for about 15 days, she was in the hospital, and they couldn't tag what was the matter with her. And after that, probably on the 14th or 15th day, they finally isolated it to terminal cancer and they said to her, it's so you're so far gone that there'd be nothing worth doing to you. She said, that's good because I don't want anything done to me anyway. And they gave me two days to figure out what I was going to do with her. And they said, well, here's hospice. And the hospice, hospital social worker said, I'll kind of coordinate that and hook you up to it. And that's basically how the process went. So what do you mean they gave you two days to figure out? Well, during those 15 days that we were back and forth and back and forth, we didn't know whether she was going to live. We didn't know what was going on. It was crisis. When you're in crisis, you don't plan for the future. You sort of hang up in the, the, the present all the time. The crisis is the now. It just continues to be a now. So once. Once they told us what was going to happen, that she was going to die, but it wasn't going to be tomorrow, that it was going to be a month from now, then we had to plan out what we were going to do for the month, but because of the, the way Medicare works, you don't, once the prognosis is made, if she's terminal, and there's not a whole lot more we can do, and she doesn't need to be on any machine, she needs to be taking some pills, then it's up to the family to figure out what's the next step. How old was she? 67. And she already qualified for Right. Um, how did you hear about that? Well, it's interesting. Bonnie Miller was... Um, former student of mine, and she did her master's thesis or independent study project at Chapel Hill on the hospice legislation. But Bob Miller, her husband, and Bonnie were instrumental in starting the hospice program. So I knew of hospice, and the year before, my brother had, had cancer and ultimately died of it. So I begged my sister-in-law to get involved with hospice, but she didn't want to because it's a small community and didn't want her business being done in by, um, didn't want anybody in the community to know about her interpersonal family business. So I had known about it, but the irony was is that while we were in crisis, we never thought of hospice, you know, it was just like, crisis, you know, think about it. Then finally, when they started to tell us, then we began to think, well, we got to do something. Okay, what were your feelings and doubts when you started considering hospice? I mean, did you, did you not want them to be a part of your personal life? Was that a hard thing to just let someone in? No, that wasn't hard at all. What was hard was Imagining that I was going to all of a sudden take care of my mother until she died. What, in my mind, hospice was, I had this vision that hospice would hang around with you until the person died. You know, you have this sort of romantic idea that everybody's around the bed and the hospice is there and they help you mourn and all that, but that's... That's not what it was. What it was was that 98% of the time that you're doing the care business, nobody's around. What the reality was was that hospice helped coordinate the links between 
my family and the doctor. They helped coordinate the links between my family and the medical supply equipment company. They helped coordinate the services when my son wasn't doing real well with the whole business of my by his grandmother being there, between him and the art therapist. They helped get me involved with a group at hospice. They came in and bathed my mother and changed the sheets two or three times a week, uh, which took the burden off. But the nurse checked her out and would sort of say, well, she's moving a little slower this today or moving a little faster. So there was that kind of talking support. You just felt like you weren't alone. But what I didn't realize was that caregiving is a full-time business. And hospice is only there to help relieve the burden by coordinating and helping people become sort of professional caregivers. That's what a caregiver does in a short period of time. He becomes a professional caregiver. Um, did your mother contribute to the decision about receiving hospice? Did she have difficulty with that? Not at all. She had to sign some papers. But did she want to? Did she understand that it was telling her she couldn't receive any life for long she, she She initiated it. She said she doesn't want chemotherapy. She doesn't want to be on any tubes. She, she had her mind. She knew that she did what she wanted and what she didn't want. So there was no problem with that. She um, loved the hospice people. Was it, was it kind of scary to accept that, in a way, you're accepting all over again, this is only six months or less of her life left? You know, signing all those papers, you're saying, yes, I'm acknowledging that. It wasn't that. It was, we were signing... Well, our particular case was a little different, maybe, from some cases. We didn't know if she was going to make it out of the hospital. And then once they got her sort of level, they said, well, ah, she got another month. So the way we saw the world was that it was another month. So it wasn't scary by any stretch of the imagination. In a, in a sick sort of way, we were happy that we had a month. You know, happy we had a month. But it turned out to be five months. It wasn't one month, it was five months. So... No, that, that finality of it, if anything, it was just the opposite because we kept waiting for it to happen and about after a month, um, we keep waiting and waiting and then you begin to realize that they shouldn't put time limits on people's death. Doctors don't know. People die when they die. They, and Doctors make statistical guesses. You know, I've had 50 patients like this, and 43 of them die within six months or five months, and so the likelihood of her going within that amount of time, or 75% go with, like your mother, go within a one-month period, so likelihood of her going within one month was statistical, but there's the difference between the aggregate view of the world and the, the personal. And the personal was that Hannah was jumping up and down on my mother's bed, and the kids didn't know what death was in the, the real sense. Somebody was alive, and they didn't see her dying, and they saw her living. Yeah. And so one month turned into five months because of love and life. Okay. Um, you said that you can you describe some of the red tape you had to go through, um, like before receiving hospice and maybe you know during? As far as insurance and Well, I must say that the hospice staff was tremendously professional. Uh, one of the things that I pointed out to them that when you're a hospice caregiver and you get assigned the role of caring for somebody until he or she dies, at least in my case, and I imagine it works like that with a lot of folks, that once you get the final approval from the doctors that this is the end, mm -hmm. you sort of swell up with the idea that you're going to care for this person in the best possible fashion that can be. And so I ran right out and spent a hundred bucks on, on the prescriptions, and all I needed to do was wait one more day, and the Medicare would have picked up the prescriptions. So one of the things that hospice didn't bother to tell us, they said the services don't start to get home, but they didn't bother to say that, hey, look it, get your doctor to give $5 worth of prescriptions to get you through tonight, 
and then tomorrow you'll sign up for Medicare, and that would have saved $95. So that was one piece of red tape that I pointed out to them, that they, they were in their enthusiasm to get me on. <clears throat> didn't quite understand my enthusiasm in a, in a sort of crazy way. That was one bit of red tape. The other bit of red tape, which I thought was interesting, it wasn't really red tape, but there are lots of volunteers ready, willing, and able to volunteer for hospice uh, in different capacities over at the unit. Um, this came not at the beginning of my hospice experience, but in the middle. But I just saw people with trays and in and out and cleaning bedpans and doing this and doing that. And I said, God, there's a lot of volunteers here. And there it took two months for me to get a volunteer to come into my house. And I sort of think that that is that because it's easier to, to volunteer over at the unit because you've got the nurses and the doctors and the hospital to kind of buffer you between the reality of somebody dying and uh, the idea of doing good work for people. Whereas if you go volunteer in somebody's house, that woman goes into, or man goes into uncontrollable vomiting or uh, uh, dies. That person is alone there. And that, that kind of volunteering, I don't think really works well in the souls of people that want to give. Uh, so it took me a long time. And the person that, that did the volunteering was, not a former hospice person, but a person whose husband died in a similar fashion that my mother ultimately died with cancer, and, and, but they, he just never got back home. Okay, um, so you were the primary caregiver, and yeah. what were some of the things that you had to give up when you decided to take that on? Give up? <laughs> I mean, well, did you have to make sacrifices to be the primary caregiver? You give up psychological freedom when you, you see, when somebody's bedridden 24 hours a day and you're the primary caregiver and hospice comes in for a, a bathing twice a week, uh, you know, a sponge bath, what you give up is you give up all the time that you spend with your family because when people have terminal cancer, depending on the kind, and my mother had the kind, and many cancer patients have different kinds of, of bodily responses, but during the early stages, my mother was semi-mobile, and I had to be responsible for cooking all of her meals. She couldn't eat very much, but it, it boiled down to just maybe an egg and some oatmeal and some tea and some Lipton soup and stuff like that, but we went through a range of stuff from spaghetti, and stuff. so I was the main cook. So you figure it out. The guy of the family is supposed to be working, and I was on research leave, but you have to cook three times a day. Since she was sleeping in, in the dining room of our house, and she couldn't get up to the bathroom, we had a portable toilet, so she basically was eating in her bathroom. So it was my responsibility to every time she had to go to the bathroom to make sure that since, you know, you wouldn't want to eat in your bathroom, so I made sure that every time she went to the bathroom that the thing was cleaned out with good disinfectant and stuff like that. So there was three times a day that she had to get meals prepared, and three times a day you had to bring the meals back in, and you have to watch over that, and there must have been seven or eight times a day, depending on the kinds of medication she was taking, that she was going to the bathroom, and then she had to be washed up during the day, and there were times when she had accidents and she had to be cleaned, and, and so it was constant around the clock, and if you weren't doing things physically, it was psychologically. There was my aunt calling and my brother calling, and this person calling, and there were bills to be taken care of, and you have to take over. You basically, what you give up is you give up your life, and you don't give it up, you sort of do it on overdrive, and you take on another person's life. Plus the psychological uh, impact of knowing that you're never going to see this person again for the rest of your life, that's balanced against the psychological impact of that I don't like to see my mother in these positions. I mean, if she were my spouse, that would be one thing, you know, for better or for worse than death do you part, but when you're a 40-year-old man or a 39-year-old man and you start to see your mother in positions that you've never seen her in before, and I imagine that works the flip for 
women that have to do it with their fathers or with their sisters. I mean, I had to do some things that uh, were not very comfortable, and to this day are not very comfortable. So you don't, it's not like you give up anything. It's you take on so much more that everything gets pushed and rearranged and twisted and turned. So it rolls back and affects your family. It rolls back and affects your job. And it rolls back and affects your physical well-being and your psychological well-being. You don't, you don't give up anything. You take on something. And by taking on something, other things get pushed in different directions. What was um, maybe one of the hardest things you had to do? Put my fingers in her butt. Either for suppositories when she was um, so sick that she couldn't keep food down, or when she was so stuffed up that she was uncomfortable and, and just had to scream it out all the time that I, I can't stand it. And so you carve out a little block in your mind and say, this has got nothing to do with my mother. This has to do with a human being that's hurting right now. And so, you know, little boys have the Madonna complex, you know, that their mothers are perfect beings. And you don't like to do these kinds of things with perfect beings. But human beings that are in pain, you do them. And that to me, or watching her vomit, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. Not just watching her, but having to clean her up. And, and I don't mean to be gory about this. This is the reality of caregiving when you're in the, the kind of cancer that we had. You know, she had uh, obstruction, so she had cancer all through here. We don't know exactly where. She probably had lung cancer. But when, when it, the tumor got big enough on her stomach, it just kept pushing her stomach. So it finally got to the point where she, you know, I'm going to be on tape here, you might edit some of this out, but, you know, it, it, the, the finality, the most difficult thing was to see her vomit her own feces. Yeah. That was the ultimate in disgust for me. The, the, the real ultimate was when I almost got, I almost got to the point where I had to die for her. That's, that's when it got to the point where she couldn't even move enough to get bedpan or to get out of bed, you know, that, and I wasn't around enough. Those were the points where it got very, very bad. And those those take its toll, not in the short run. In the long run, it just wears away, wears away, wears away. So that by the end of the process, the caregiver really and truly wishes that the person was dead. No, you don't wish they were dead. You wish they died. But you don't want them to be dead over the long haul. You just wish they died for their sake because they begin to lose dignity. And for your sake, because you, how do you put this, that you become cold and frozen and you lose a little bit of your humanity in the process of trying to be tremendously human. Right. And you know, it's like being in a war, in a sense. You sort of freeze off your emotions and just do what has to be done. But in the meantime, it's your mother. It's not a friend. It's not a cousin. It's not a neighbor. It's, it's your mother. And Mothers, whether you like them or love them or hate them, they're your mother. There's a, a bigger reality to motherhood than, than, than just friendship and things like that. So while you were, you know, doing the caretaking role, which sounds like takes up all of your time, how did you manage to also be the man of the house and a husband and a father and you know, all that? Kate was. Kate was. Kate was the, you know, because I was around a lot, I did a lot of the cooking at the time. I kept the house basically clean. I, she was working. But any extra stuff with the kids, she did it. She, she did it. How did you find time for each other? Um, the crisis itself brings a lot of time to talk and to, to get close, um, you know, because it's an issue. It's always there, you know. I mean, it's the focus. So we, sometimes we did find time, sometimes we didn't. I'm sure that over the long haul, it has taken its toll as well, you know. It was a, not an easy experience, and, and particularly for sons, 
we were about six or seven percent of the caregivers in the United States. Um, were you in a support group for adult caregivers? Well, I was the wonderful thing about hospice, but in a crazy sense, not the wonderful thing about hospice. I, yeah. Their argument was that the best support group was for the people over at the unit whose people were about ready to die, the terminal. You know, there's the terminal people and the respite people. Mm -hmm. And those in terminal could go to a support group every Wednesday night. Well, I said, I need a support group, you know. It's going crazy for me. I'm just going nuts. I need to talk to other people like me. And they said, well, those people are so preoccupied with their caregiving out in the community that they can never find time to come. I didn't think that that was a good, yeah. a good analysis. That could have worked with somebody that didn't spend his professional life in social services. But I had the advantage of understanding program development and being a caregiver, so I just thought that that was an agency very busy that didn't have the, the time at that time to add a new program, a valuable one, and, and have the personnel to, to deal with it. But the one, the twice that I went, it was a tremendous relief to be in the company of people whose souls, and when you do this kind of experience, and I don't want to over magnify it, but it, it's you know, there are very few times that you get close to what life is all about. And when you watch somebody, I called it the death march. When you're in a death watch or death march, you get to see the bigger picture of life. You know, you get to see the totality of it. But it's but a lot of people don't aren't there. You know, they're not there, so they, they don't quite get it. So they don't know what you're going through psychologically. And to be involved in the group, it's kind of like on 30-something, they're doing this stuff on cancer now. And last week was very good because it showed the in-group and the group support is very good because everybody knows what it feels like and you don't have to get into much language about knowing what it feels like when you're caregiving and you're losing your, your spouse or mother or father or cousin or whatever the case may be. So the support group turned out to be, and the metaphor that I used in the support group is that when I was sitting in there and listening to everybody talk, I just thinking to myself, oh, God, does this feel good. I mean, lousy that we're all there, but it felt good to hear people talk about it because this woman, I said, yeah, and you know what drives me crazy is the oxygen machine because a lot of cancer patients, if it's lung cancer or some kind of cancer, they, they lose their capacity to breathe real well. And uh, this woman, when I said oxygen machine, she just went, because that's what the machine sounds like. And then, mm, pop, 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 and 24 hours a day, you got this thing going, mm, pop, 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 pop. so I just felt like, you know, that was, she was saying, relate, relate, and it felt very good. And I think that one of the holes in the program is a lack of understanding of the need for support for the caregivers, that they need to be talking to each other. Mm -hmm. It would make their, their, I came back with some energy, and we could be energized. You've answered some of my questions. Um, so, can you go over some of the ways that you feel like hospice really met your needs and some of the ways that it just maybe didn't meet your needs? I know it didn't meet your needs and that it didn't provide you with a support group during your caregiving. Yeah, but there was a tenth of it. They, they met my needs. They. Um, they, they met all my, my needs uh, wonderfully. You know, I just didn't understand how, and I don't think anybody really understands unless they are, um, you know, 18, 20 months of cancer and, and then they go into hospice. Mm -hmm. Then they, they understand what's ahead of them because they, they've kind of been led up to it. But, People go in and find out that they've only got six months to go, and then it gets thrown on the lap of the caregiver. Um, what hospice didn't do, and I don't think it can do, is let you know what the, the that hospice isn't the main caregiver. You are. And see, when you think of hospice, you think of oh, they're going to give care, and they, well, they do. They help change the bed, and they come in and check and the social workers talk to you and coordinate services, but there's 168 hours in the week. And hospice is there for a couple. So one of the things that, that uh, 
my needs weren't met is that I didn't quite understand how difficult this, this was going to be. I don't think anybody can ever understand it, and I don't even know if hospice can help people understand it. Uh, other than that, I, you know, I think so highly of the organization, I've continued to volunteer for them and what I do best, and that's the program development grant writing stuff, and worked with them all summer long and things like that. No, I, the respite unit was good. The, Care was good. They coordinated the funeral aspect of it. You know, I mean, it was just, just everything was done well. Um, when your mother passed away, did you miss the routine of caring for her? Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Uh, uh I brought the toilet out the morning she died, and I cried. But from my toes, I could feel the tingles of the cry in my toes because the toilet was a symbol of how much I really hated to do what I do. You know, I mean, I didn't want to tend to my mother's bodily functions. You do it. I miss the caregiving? No way. No, I miss my mother. Yeah. I don't know. I, maybe some people have withdrawal from it, but not me. I didn't miss the vomiting. I didn't miss the toilet. I didn't miss the, the food not going down. I didn't miss the regimen of pills. I just didn't miss anything. So and still don't. Do you still feel this was better to um, let her die this way than maybe in a hospital hooked up to a machine? Absolutely, absolutely. Like you might be hearing one thing, but the flip of that is, is that the only thing that I'd ever do different, I would, if, if I were given the exact same situation over again, the only thing I would do is I would beg everybody to not tell me the range of time that she has to live. Please don't tell me that it's going to be between one and two months, or just say somewhere in the neighborhood of six months. Because then you're kind of expecting. You don't know. It's a real strange experience to when the month passes and nothing happens, yeah. and then two months pass, then three months pass, and four months pass, and they get continuously worse. I mean, she right. went from 134 pounds to 67 pounds or 70, 65. Who knows? It was just just a bunch of bones with some skin over it at the end, and yet her mind was intact and things like that. So you just don't know. Progressive, but God, it wasn't a month, that's for sure. So, what were some of the rewarding things about having her home? Well, some very personal ones is that uh, we've got to settle some issues that we never settled. You know, there's the sort of metaphorical, you know, on your human behavior stuff, you'll, the mother and son issues. And those were all settled. Slate, white, clean. Um, got to meet her grandmother. The grandmother got to meet her kids. My mother was a, I don't know if she felt comfortable coming to my house. I don't know whether I felt comfortable having her at my house, but her stays were, she'd leave the motor running. She got her way to Florida and stopped and be off the next day and never really got a chance to meet the kids. She was a great telephone grandmother. And here she had a chance for five months to, to really, my kids got a, such a wonderful imprint of, of their grandmother and their mind and what a nice person she was and how they related to each other. And, you know, that's, that's, that's worth all the gold in South Africa. Uh, other things, um, I really got to see what a good medical practice was like. Uh, Piedmont Family Medicine, uh, Dr. Nita Henderson, and Ann Marie Mazaki, and John Malone. <laughs> restored my faith in what human beings are all about. That, that, you know, Anita came over to our house. She was the primary doctor. When my mother had a stroke, she was over there right after work, and she would have been there in a minute if she thought it was essential. She, she was right there. When was the last time a doctor made a call, especially if somebody's going to broke? Yeah. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Mazaki refused to pull my mother around to the emergency room, have her walk out of the door around to the emergency room and then readmitted to the hospital. She stayed an extra two and a half hours just because of her principles, uh, that people shouldn't have to go out of the door and back in once they're in the hospital so the hospital could pick up an extra 200 or $300 for admitting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that takes character. The way they handled the announcing to my mother about that she had terminal cancer, it was with hugs and kisses. and, and uh, and just restored my faith. I was a profound critic of most of the medical profession, but I met some real human beings. Uh, Eric Nystrom, who's an oncologist, was wonderful. She, she, 
Sherry Dickstein. My mother had a big tumor on her um, ovaries, her, her pelvic tumor, whatever it was. She was wonderful. I just met some wonderful people in the medical profession. I think they're highly paid, uh, overpaid at times, but they're certainly, these folks are worth every dime. Sounds like they're really dedicated. They're human beings, you know, it's something you forget about them yeah. when you think about doctors. The social worker and the nurse, I mean, I will be forever in their gratitude. They were, they laughed with me, they cried with me, they, um, they understood when I said on numerous occasions, I wish she would be dead. And they, they knew that I wasn't hateful. Right. That you don't like to watch your mother vomit eight, nine times and, you know,